Phone lines are open wide. You've got questions. We've got answers. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Line of Fire. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. Phone lines are wide open. Any subject, any question, any comment that ties in in any way with anything we ever talk about on the radio, anything I've written, spoken about, something a guest has talked about, wide-ranging subjects. Yes, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. As always, those who differ with us, critics and others, phone lines are open to you as well. Let us start with Morris in Bonita, Florida. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hello, Morris. Are you there? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I had a question. Um, I've been kind of going back and forth with uh, some friends on the Daniel 9, um, and they pretty much to, to, to sum it all up. Does it mean when the heaven and earth pass away, was that referring to the temple? Um, the second destruction of the temple? No, um, sir. Absolutely and, not. Okay, good. That, that, is, that is a myth. That is an absolute myth. Okay, I, I'm with you on that. And I have one more question because I got I, I deal with this class of people. I deal with another class of people who yeah. who are very much a third in saying that Apostle Paul was a false apostle, and I disagree with that. Um, but it's very deep rooted in some people. So, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's complete nonsense uh, on every level. The writings of Paul were received early by the early church. Uh, there is there is no major rejection of his writing except in schismatic groups. Uh, he was welcomed by the apostles. Uh, we, if, if you're going to say that Paul was a false apostle, then that means Luke was a false teacher. So you eliminate the book of Luke and you eliminate the book of Acts. You eliminate Second Peter, which commends the writings of Paul. You eliminate the testimony of, of all the early church fathers that's, that speak of Paul. So it, it's complete nonsense. It's some schismatic groups. Now, if if someone is not claiming to be a follower of Jesus or claiming that the, the Bible is not the Word of God, and that there were these other groups, there was a tension between James, Jacob, there was a tension between James and Paul, or that, that Paul started something new and it's different than the original Jesus, that's a whole other thing. In other words, they're throwing out the Bible, right? And they're just taking a little bit here and a little bit there and claiming that uh, these things. But o- otherwise, if you're going to give the Bible any authority— and the early church any authority, then of course, Paul was one of the key men raised up by God and the writer of almost half of the New Testament, whose, whose writings are critically foundationally important. If you throw out Paul, you throw out the gospel, you throw out the New Testament, you throw out the Bible as we have it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yes, sure thing. 866-34-TRUTH. Just to clarify one point that Morris was asking, there is a teaching going around that when Jesus said, that until heaven and earth pass away, that thus and such will not pass away. So Matthew 5, Matthew 24, that that was an idiom referring to the temple in Jerusalem. And he wasn't talking about the end of the age and the destruction of the heavens and the earth or the renewal of the heavens and the earth. He was talking about the destruction of the physical temple. Nonsense. Internet myth. Nonsense. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Milanda in Adrian, Missouri. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, Dr. Brown. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Awesome. Hey, I have a question regarding my pastor. So I've been pretty frustrated. Um, My wife and I have been at church just because we have so much zeal for the Lord. We've been saved almost two years, um, and we want to do so much. We want to do some outreach. We want to do some... Um, you know, go to maybe some pride parades and spread the gospel. We just have a lot of a lot of zeal and excitement, and it just seems like our church doesn't do anything. I mean, we don't do fundraisers, we don't do outreach, we do, we do nothing. We show up on Sunday and we go out to lunch afterwards, watch the NFL, and then just have a hunky dory day. And so, the problem is, is I've confronted him before, and he gets super defensive, 
says things like, you know, you can tell he's convicted is what it is. You're talking um, about your, your pastor. He, when you say confronted him, you mean your pastor? Yes. Okay. And so I'll confront him about these things, and he'll say things like, oh, well, you're young, you're not mature enough, um, you know, basically just accusing me of, I guess, being too young and not understanding, and you have a lot of zeal, but, you know, I had a lot of zeal when I was first saved, and I'm glad that I didn't go out because I would have looked like an idiot, blah, 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 and I'm just like, how do I handle that? Right, so you're in the wrong place. Uh, that's the pastor of the church, and he's the leader. Just like if you have kids, you're the leader in your home. And just like if you're the, the boss of a, of a business, you're the leader. So God hasn't called you to lead the church. And if you make an appeal, not confront, not rebuke, but if you make an appeal to the pastor and ask him, would he consider these things or you're grieved or burdened over this, or would he release you to, to raise up others to go out? If he says, no, that's not who we are, that's not what we do, then you, you honor him and move on somewhere else. Uh, if you have to drive two hours to be of people of like mind, if you have to get in a, a, a home fellowship or something like that, it's, it's not for you to change the church. For example, let's say that you're a terrific Italian cook and you go to a local Chinese restaurant that's uh, got bad Chinese and you think, wow, if you just change to an Italian restaurant, I could help you and you could make a lot of money. Well, that's not your, your place to do it. So it's frustrating. You may be 100% right in all your perceptions, but God didn't make you the pastor. And that's simply the way it works, or if it's led by a team of elders or whoever. Uh, so the same way, uh, somebody may not agree with the way you're raising your kids, but that's not for them to tell you what to do because they're not your kids. So it, it is frustrating. Uh, you don't want to let your zeal be quenched. But if that's where the people are at, then you're in the wrong place. The whole thing of church is not who your friends are or who you like hanging out with, but people of like-minded faith who want to go for it together. Get yourself in a place like that and, and give yourself to the gospel and serve in whichever ways you can and, and get involved. And if it's a healthy church, they'll be doing a lot of outreach already. But then when they get to know you and find you trustworthy, they'll empower you to do things as well. So rather than stay frustrated and be against the leaders there, best to graciously move on and ask for blessing yeah. as you do. Say, hey, I don't want to be a nuisance. I don't want to be a thorn in your side. Uh, but obviously, I, I don't fit here. And you're the pastor. I'm not. So just ask for your blessing. We're looking, you know, we'll, we'll be making our home somewhere else. All right? Yeah, thank you. What's What's unfortunate is I'm... I'm very close with him. Like we fish and we do things outside of church. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just biblically that we disagree. And I'm like, isn't it a call for all of us to go, you know, faith without works is dead. I mean, and so, and what I wanted to ask you what about respond, what you said is, um, are you saying that it's kind of like a way that he runs his church? Like, cause I'm kind of thinking about this and like an objective problem in, in the body of Christ, not just, how you prefer to run a church. Like, aren't we called to outreach and yes, called yes. to go see? Like I said, you could be you 100% know, so. right, but it's not your job to change the, the church unless God's made you the leader. And here, I'll give right. you an example. Yeah. Let's say that it's a Baptist church that doesn't believe in speaking in tongues, and you've been filled with the Spirit, and you speak in tongues, and you're 100% sure it's scriptural. So that's my position, right? Uh, but right. the pastor and the elders don't believe in it. So you could say, hey, would you mind reading this book about this? Or could we have a discussion one day about these verses? And if they say, we've read those books, we've had our discussion, this is what we believe, then you can either honor them and, and remain quiet, or you can honor them and leave to go somewhere else. But that's what they teach. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And they're accountable to God for it. But it's, it's not to the individual congregants to now dictate the way change goes. Authority just doesn't work like that. It's just like if you work in a company and you know this company is not acting ethically and you challenge them to act ethically and they don't, well, then you leave, right? Because you don't own the company. Right. So what I'd say is the best way to maintain a friendship with the pastor is to just say, hey, look, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a thorn in your side here. Uh, I, I'm burning to get out. I believe the church is called to get out. If it's not the way you see things, hey, I'm going to go somewhere else and let's be friends. Uh, I've had, I've 
maintain friendships with people by not being in the same church with them over the years. Right. And we got, we work <laughs> together better and are better friends from the outside. And then the other thing is pray, pray, pray. All right. That's, that's the other thing. Yeah. Pray, pray, pray. God, your best, N- not negative prayers. God, your best for pastor, your best for the church. May, and then pray for yourself, Lord, may we all have a heart burning for you. And if, if, if you feel, hey, I'm, sp- I'm supposed to do that, support him, honor him, and then pray secretly, fine. Otherwise, move on somewhere else, get out there serving, and, uh, or at the very least, if you stay, say, can I have your blessing to go out? And, and if he says, go for it, do it, then you do it, get some other friends to do it with you. But otherwise, get past the frustration and move on. Hey, thank you, sir for the call. And my counsel here is kind of universal based on these principles. 866-348-7884. Let's go to Jay in Boise, Idaho. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello, and thank you for uh, taking the calls. Sure thing. Um, So I had a question and I've been in a dialogue with a good friend of mine who's a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and one of the primary areas of disagreement between your standard evangelical and SDA would be uh, the identity of who would type a scapegoat. Um, and I won't go into the law, to the, all of it because it takes too long, but um, it fundamentally boils down to the question used for, or to the word used for scapegoat, uh, Azazel. Yeah. And their view is that a goat for Azazel would be for a being Azazel. But my understanding of the word is that originally it just means something like uh, entire removal and that it doesn't become a being until after the destruction of the second temple, um, kind of in, in a similar vein to Lilith. So I was curious, do you have any insight on what that word means and, and the origins of this angelic figure Azazel? Yeah, sure thing. So I I will comment on that on the other side of the break. So Azazel, uh, translated in English as scapegoat, the goat that escapes. Is that referring to a demon in the wilderness? Or is it saying this is for the goat that will escape? Or is it the goat is for this demon? We'll answer that on the other side of the break. There's a very interesting verse in the book of Revelation in the third chapter. As Jesus is speaking to one of the churches in Asia Minor, Revelation chapter 3, he gives this promise. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So that leads to the question, is it possible to have your name blotted out of the book of life? Is it possible to be a believer and have your name blotted out? I say yes. As I understand scripture, we can choose to walk away from God. We can choose to forfeit eternal life. We can choose to forfeit our status as sons and daughters of God. We can choose to leave his household and his family and reject him as Lord. Now, I want to be perfectly clear. He has promised to keep us safe to the end. No one can pluck us out of his hand. Nothing can separate us from his love. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He does not write our name in the Lamb's book of life in pencil. And when we do good, he writes it a little stronger. When we do bad, he erases half of it. And I'm saved one day and lost the next and saved one minute and lost the next. That's unscriptural. That's no way to live. That's contrary to what scripture says. We need to rest in his promises, rest in his goodness, Rest in the assurance that he will keep us strong to the end, that he will finish what he started. I believe that. I believe that he has the power to keep everything I've entrusted to him until that day. At the same time, the many warnings through the New Testament I take with utmost seriousness from Paul, from Peter, from John, from others. I take with the utmost seriousness that we can turn away from 
the Lord, in which case he would blot our name out of the book of life. May it never happen to you. May it never happen to me. Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Don't forget, friends, to sign up for our emails. This way you'll be alerted to latest articles. I, I just recorded a, a little well, rant, you could call it, uh, about forgiveness of student debt compared to the cross. People are bringing this up. You'll know, hey, here's a video just came out. Here are the latest articles. Here's info on coming to your area to speak. Uh, here's a special resource package we put together. So go to the website, ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org. Sign up for the emails. We'll put you on our welcome tour. You'll really enjoy it and send you a free mini book, an ebook on how to pray for America. Also, where you're on the website, be sure to check out the Israel tour. We still have room on it for May 2023, as well as still time to get the advanced copy signed numbered of the political seduction of the church. People are already getting it and sending notes to how much, uh, as to how much they're appreciating it all on the website, askdrbrown.org. All right, so uh, Jay, back to you. There is actually a major debate among scholars to this day, and it is not solved. Uh, was there a demon in the wilderness called Azazel? And was the second goat, one goat was killed and its blood brought into the holiest place of all, and then there was a second goat that was sent out into the wilderness. Was that sent out to a demon? Was it sent to a demon in some type of payment? No, cannot be. Certainly wrong. Was it sent out to a demon, meaning it goes into an unclean place, it, it brings the, the pollution out to an unclean place? That's one way to read it. The other way would be Azazel deriving it as if it was from Az Azal, the goat that escaped, the goat that went out. There is debate among scholars to this day. Uh, with, without question, though, the two goats point to the twofold work of Jesus, uh, dying to cleanse us of our sins and dying to remove our sins from us. Both of those aspects are expressed in what the two goats did. So they are both types of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. That much is certain from a typological point of view. I appreciate that. Um, I, one of the one of the uh, back and forth we've been having is um, me and this other gentleman has been mm -hmm. the um, from what I can gather because I've dealt with this with Lilith before. You know, the word Lilith is in Isaiah thirty four fourteen, but there's no figure called Lilith for almost over a thousand years. No, no, no. Um, Actually, to the so contrary, Lilith is is a demon. There, it's a night demon. That's known all the way back to Sumerian and Akkadian uh, literature. But well, so, so to clarify, though, what, what I mean specifically is a uh, it's like a because my understanding is like it's a Sumerian class of demon. But the, the woman, the figure Lilith, is a later literary invention. Oh, oh yeah, um, yeah, a absolutely. Or the idea that Adam was first married to Lilith and, and then he divorced her. So now she tries to kill right. all the subsequent children. Right. Those those myths develop later, but the idea of Lilithu uh, being related, be, being a, a demon of, of the night of some kind, yeah, that's that's clearly what Isaiah is speaking about. But the, the traditions that come out of it, yeah, yeah, those are, those are many hundreds of years later. Right, and so, um, so my understanding was, because I've, I've been unable to find a reference to the figure Azazel, um, Correct. I, I think the earliest I was able to find is Mishnah. Right, right. But no, no. The reason, the reason the is— before that? Right. No, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, but we don't have everything attested. You know what I'm saying? Just because we right. don't have a specific reference. That's why scholars still debate it. So your research is accurate to the, to the best of my knowledge. I haven't, I haven't studied this in depth in some time, but I don't think there's anything new discovered. But you just—you have to be careful with saying, well— uh, the, the old saying, absence of evidence is not evidence of, of absence. Just because we don't have a certain thing attested, a demonic figure in other ancient Near Eastern literature uh, called Azazel doesn't mean that such a figure did not exist. And again, there's scholarly speculation about that. Uh, but thank you. Your, your, your facts as presented 
are accurate based on what we know. I appreciate it. 866-34-TRUTH. By the way, with that now, we have two phone lines open. If you want to try to call, this is a perfect time to do it. And we go to Mario over in London. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much for taking the call. Before asking the question, I want to say uh, I'm coming to the I can wait. My wife is very excited. Uh, I, would, I would be very pleased, I'm sure. Uh, my question relates to the work of uh, Dennis McDonald. I wanted to ask if you're familiar uh, with it. So basically, he's a New Testament scholar who argues that uh, there are a lot of similarities between the Gospel accounts uh, and the New Testament in general and uh, the Homeric epic. And so uh, one point that he makes, which bothers me a little bit, because I never heard a very good refutation of it, is that the first, um, in First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 15, which is the first resurrection account, mm -hmm. uh, basically there is nothing physical, and the physical, um, let's say, resurrection kind of uh, testimonies are in the gospel, but those are very, very similar to the Homeric epic. Uh, so, for instance, the Gospel of Luke, uh, if you read the stories, I think it's, uh, it's very similar to one of the Iliad story, uh, stories. So I wanted to ask, like, uh, have you ever looked into it? Uh, what do you think about it? Obviously, everyone kind of tries to find similarities between the New Testament and other works, and usually they fall apart. But this one seems to me like a good, uh, a good argument. And thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Yes, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm not sure if I've followed every part, so I just want to ask a question. Hey, did you call some months back after uh, you and your wife just had another baby, a new baby? Yes. Okay, I remember yes. that. This Mario from London stuck in my head, and when you mentioned yes. your wife again, I thought, wait a second. Okay, good, good. I, I did remember that. Um, all right, so so the the parallel here that that is being raised, an extra-biblical parallel, is comparing these first appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, comparing them to what exactly? I think there is an account in the Iliad uh, from Homer, uh, which uh, is very similar, like, uh, you know, uh, there is, uh, I can't remember the name of the Iliad uh, hero, but basically goes back to his father and he says, look, I've been attacked, but I'm back alive, something like this. So my point is like, obviously... Yeah, I, I don't see... Around. Right, these these... People looking for parallels, this has happened for centuries and centuries and centuries. They simply don't exist. The, the type of thing that happened to as many people as it happened, uh, the idea that a, a myth could just be created and now a movement built on it when you would have had a whole generation of eyewitnesses who'd say it never happened. So there was no body that wrote, there was no person, there was no one that we ate with and talked with and the hundreds of people saw before he ascended to heaven and these things. So the, the, the parallels are very weak. Same with virgin birth. The alleged parallels, the more you look at them, you think, wow, the gospel accounts are like night and day. The same way here. So you, again, a reference to the Iliad or something, everyone's known that, you know, the, the Greco-Roman scholars and, and, and early Mediterranean scholars, they, they all knew these things. So, no, to me, all of it breaks down, especially when you scrutinize it more deeply and uh, the nature of the crucifixion, the amount of people seeing him die, the amount of people seeing him rise, the surprise at it, the shock at it, and all of that. It really does break down. Have, have you read my book, Resurrection? Um, not really, Dr. Brown. I have to confess. Uh, no, that's a, that's that's all right. Book. There's a lot there's a lot to read for every book that's out there that I've read. There are multiplied millions that I didn't. Uh, but you may enjoy looking into it. Resurrection, investigating a rabbi from Brooklyn, a preacher from Galilee, and the event that changed the world. Resurrection. I'm sure you get it either paperback or or an ebook over in England. I think you'll really find it interesting because I look at a, a contemporary potential parallel and then show how it only highlights the uniqueness of the resurrection. Hey, thank you for the question. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, all right, let's go to Roy in South Carolina. I'll try to answer your question before the break, but if not, I'll finish after. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Michael Bryan. I really appreciate your ministry. Thank you. Um, I actually have two quick questions. One you probably can rattle off and answer very quickly. Um, one of which was uh, you've addressed many false prophets. I just was interested in who you considered uh, 
some profits that you would trust in. And then my other question, which I gave to the uh, uh, when I called in, was, what is your advice for employees that work for companies uh, that pay for people to travel for an abortion? Should they uh, contact their HR department and say they don't agree with that statement, to, you know, or just listen to the Holy Spirit? And each case is unique on what that employee should do. Yes. Thank you. All right. So. Yeah, everyone has to work that out. Second question first. Everyone has to work that out. In other words, if a company is saying we're taking our profits and we're using some of our income to fund abortions, if you can't get an abortion in this state, we'll fund you to travel to another state, and you're an employee there, do you keep working there? Do you register your disapproval and say you don't want to— to, to be an active participant, you want to be on record that you differ. Uh, do you use that company as a platform to speak out against it? Everyone has to get God's mind on that and find out what the strategy is. Uh, obviously, many companies use funds for all kinds of things that we differ with. Where do we draw the line? What's too far? So everyone has to work that out for themselves. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out a brother I've gotten to know in recent years, but he's been around for decades, Jim LaFoon. I think it's L-A-F-O-O-N. Uh, highly regarded as a very, very accurate prophetic voice today, but one that's behind the scenes. You won't see him in a lot of big high places, very much behind the scenes, but I've been exposed to him in recent years. All right, God bless. Have you heard of the Apocrypha? Do you know what it is? Or, or mainly you're from a, a Greek Orthodox or a Catholic background and, and you have books in your Bible and your Protestant friends don't and you, you wonder, why don't they have those books? Well, let's talk about that together. There are books called the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha literally meaning hidden, but these are books that are not found in the Hebrew Bible. They are not found in the Greek New Testament but they are found in Catholic Bibles. They are found in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. They are books like 1 Maccabees or Ecclesiasticus, the Wisdom of Ben Sirah or the Prayer of Manasseh or, or Tobit and things like that. And these are books that are not explicitly quoted in the New Testament. They were written after the canon of the Old Testament was closed. In other words, once God was finished giving us the books that we call the Old Testament, it may have been generations before people realized the canon is closed. This is the Hebrew Bible. This is the Old Testament. But in God's heart, when those books were finished, they were finished. The apocryphal books were written after that time, but before the time of the New Testament. They were widely read in the early church. They were highly esteemed in the early church, but they are not quoted as scripture within the New Testament. Ultimately, the Jewish rabbis decided that they were not part of the Old Testament, and there was debate and dispute about their place in the Bible over the generations. But what we know is this, they are never quoted in the New Testament as scripture. Now, there were times in the early days of Protestantism that you'd have a Bible Old Testament, New Testament with Apocrypha in the middle over the generations that was removed from the middle. Here's how I would encourage you to relate to the Apocrypha. I do not believe that the Apocryphal books are scripture or are equal to scripture. However, they are very important historically. There are often some great theological insights and there's often great wisdom in those books. I look at the apocryphal books as in between the Bible on the one hand and a good book on the other hand. They're better than just another good book, but they are not equal to the Bible. Therefore, we should not learn doctrine from them or look to them as having final authority, but they're absolutely worth reading and knowing and understanding, especially for insight on what happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Hey friends, 
Every week, we send out edifying e-blasts. We'd love for you to receive them and be in touch with us. Go to Ask. DrBrown.org, ASKDRBrown.org, and sign up for it. Dr. Michael Brown, get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the line of fire, 866-348-7884. You've got questions of any kind relate in any way to the broadcast. We've got answers. All right, let us go to Paul in Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate all the work you do. Thanks. Um, I wanted to uh, just bring up in the Gospel of John, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, Mm -hmm. uh, he encouraged her to go get her husband, Mm -hmm. uh, to which we know she replied that she isn't married, and Jesus said, uh, correct, and you've had five others before, uh, and the one you're with now is not your husband. Yeah. um, In regards to that, my question is, as a, as a believer, there was a period of time where I was married uh, for 10 years. I ended up divorcing. The divorce was not on biblical ground. I simply had kind of turned my back on that point to, to church and God's faith due to various circumstances and being worn down in my marriage, and I walked away from that marriage. Now, since then, she is in a committed relationship, has been for three and a half years, uh, even having a child, and... Now I'm in a situation where, following my divorce, I entered into a relationship with somebody, moved in, uh, engaged in intimate practices. So we were sleeping together, and basically I'm trying to find out, after a year of that going on, I felt really close to doing that outside of the bonds of marriage. So I left that relationship. Should I be turning back to that now because I slept with her? Okay. The fact that you slept with her obviously does not justify marrying her or sleeping with her. Again, that was that was sexual immorality, of course, can be forgiven through the cross, and, and God can take our mistakes and turn them for uh, in, into stepping stones for us to grow and, and learn from. Uh, but what you really have to do is, is step back, Sit down with, uh, with a solid pastor that you're in good relationship with and review the past. And uh, you could make a very strong case to say you divorced your wife without, without biblical grounds and you don't have the right to remarry. The fact that she's in a relationship with someone else, married to someone else after you divorced her, does not free you, that argument could strongly be made. Uh, There are others who would claim that because she's in a new relationship and married, that that releases you. Uh, Others would say, no, that's if you engage in a new relationship, that's still adultery as long as the person is alive. So, Paul, I'm not going to tell you what to do there. Uh, You need to study the scriptures carefully, and you need to sit down with a godly pastor that that holds to biblical ethics and it's not just going to be a yes man and really look at this there uh, marriage is a sacred thing in god's sight and our no fault divorce culture in the church has brought terrible destruction on our society in many ways again god forgives there i know so many people that have been through difficult divorces and god's forgiven and many i believe have had grounds to remarry and they're blessed but this is something you really need to work out before the Lord and with a godly pastor, whether you can marry again. So I, I couldn't live w- without being with someone in sex. We can do anything with God's help. We can do anything with God's help. But in this particular case, you really need to sit down with the leader and, and look at things, go back through history. Uh, obviously, if the woman you divorced, your wife, is not with someone now, then it would behoove you to seek reconciliation and humble yourself and confess your sin and and show her that you're a different person and seek to reconcile. That's not an option now, but does that release you to remarry? Many would say certainly not. Others would say, well, y- yes, it would. So you really need to, to work that through. And because of the weight of this, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Uh, that's not my place. It's it's a phone call to someone I don't know that would not be righteous in the sight of the Lord for me to say more. 
So may the Lord help you to honor him. May he give you grace to live in self-control until whatever next step is or in the years ahead. Uh, and may he connect you with some godly leaders that can really speak into your life. Thank, thank you for calling with such a weighty question, but that's as far as I can go in, in an answer from this distance. Um, 866-34-TRUTH. Let me just talk here for another moment. I will weigh in on all kinds of controversial issues, even though I'm aware many times that doing so will cost me support or will, will cost me listeners or followers. That's always been immaterial. I never calculate that, even for a split second. It doesn't enter my mind. I, I'm going to do my best to speak truthfully. There are certain situations I'm asked about, and there's an argument on different ways, different sides. Scholars debate it to this day. Bible translators debate to this day. Theologians debate them to this day. People who love Jesus passionately debate them to this day. The fact that I'm not going to weigh in definitively on every point is because there are different sides to an argument, and I haven't landed in a particular place. But then there's situations like this which are so weighty. Of course I can tell this brother, no, don't sleep with this woman. And the fact that you slept with her doesn't mean you're supposed to marry her. I can say that emphatically and clearly. And I do have grave concerns about someone that divorces for no biblical reason, and then life goes on, then they, they get closer to the Lord, and now they, they want to remarry. I have grave concerns, but I am not aware of every circumstance and the whole story and narrative, so for me to say more is wrong. Also, I don't want to condemn others who are in different situations. And the moment you hear me say some of these things, you immediately feel, oh, no, I'm remarried. Is that sin? I'm not making a blanket statement. All right? So please hear these, apply them as the shoe fits. And then when you have questions, don't bury them. Take them to the Lord and say, Lord, I want what's best. And then sit down with, with solid spiritual leaders and work these things through. All right. We go back to the phones. Uh, let's go to Salt Lake City, Utah. Harry, you are on the line of fire. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Good, good. So my question is, I'm going through the book of Job in my uh, Bible reading, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, uh, why is that book considered scripture? You know, how did the Jews come to accept Job? Um, where does the book come from? It, it just seems so differently written than all the other books that it, it's kind of in a class of its own. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's in a class of its own. Uh, as I spent years writing a commentary on it, I, I'm all the more awed, awestruck by the book. But uh, we don't know exactly how every book became part of the canon of Scripture, right? Uh, in, in other words— it's one thing with the early church where you could see the process of, okay, an apostle wrote this or an eyewitness wrote this or it was an associate of an apostle, things like that. And then what was received early on, you know, the writings of Paul or, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke or whatever was received early on and then was built on. But when we're talking about the canon of Israel, it's so much more ancient and over such a long period of time that we don't know exactly how every book got in. Uh, for example, First uh, and Second Samuel. Well, you say, well, written by a prop. Well, Samuel didn't write Second Samuel. Samuel didn't write all this stuff about after his his death. Uh, and you know who wrote First and Second Kings and and First and Second Chronicles or why this book or that. So there are a lot of questions that we have, but the larger process was that over a period of time, the nation of Israel recognized a particular thing as holy and as God's word. So God, from his point, orchestrated things in such a way that the people on their part recognized these books. So by the time of Jesus, it doesn't seem to be a debate about any of the books of the what we have is the Old Testament now being part of the Bible. We we know there may have been some minor debate in the years that followed in the Jewish community, but that was based on books were already accepted, like Song of Solomon, and now some question, 
well, is that really sacred scripture? Isn't it like love songs and don't the prostitutes use some of these verses? Uh, as to the reason that Job is in the Bible, it, it presents a challenge to the simple idea that if you're righteous, everything goes well, and if you're wicked, you're always punished. And it says it doesn't always work out like that, especially in the short term. But don't now change your theology and say, well, the person suffering must have sinned, or God must be sending these evil things. No, there's often more going on behind the scenes. And then it gives voice to the, the question, the pain, the challenge many feel. It's like, hey, it's in the Bible, but let's get to the end where God himself is the answer. Where the book came from, we don't know. We don't know who wrote it. It is the most mysterious in that regard. Uh, in the Talmud, where this is discussed about when Job was written, you have a range of dates over a thousand different years speculating. So we don't know. It, it is, in terms of intellectual material and vocabulary, the loftiest book in the entire Bible, and yet we absolutely don't know who wrote it. But from everything we can tell, from the most ancient days when there's reference to Scripture or Bible or uh, things being attested like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Job was always there. Job has been accepted as scripture uh, from well before the time of Jesus without debate. How it got in, we don't know exactly. Okay. All right. And it, 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 it's such an amazing book, so different, so so um, unique from all the other books. I was just wondering how much we do know. Yeah, so that's that's it. Uh, if you ever get a chance to check out my commentary, it's called Job, The Faith to Challenge God, a new translation and commentary. Job, The Faith to Challenge God, a new translation and commentary. In the intro, I, I quote from different folks who say, you know, if, if all literature was gone in the world, they could only have one book, they'd have the book of Job. I mean, ex extraordinary stuff and a majestic book in, in that regard. And I'm so thrilled. It's part of the canon of Scripture. Okay, we'll get to as many calls as we can on the other side of the break. Make sure you visit vitaminmission.com, our sponsor, Dr. Mark, staying there. Check out the great health supplements. You get a special discount by being one of our listeners when you do. And then Dr. Stangler, in turn, in turn uh, donates generously to our ministry. So vitaminmission.com. We'll be right back. One of my friends pastors a church that I believe is the most giving church in America in terms of the amount of funds that they donate to missions and, and other causes, maybe the most giving church in the entire world. But he said to me years ago, we do not preach prosperity. We preach generosity. In other words, our emphasis is on giving. Our emphasis is on honoring the Lord by giving. He is a giving God in his love he gives and our love for him and love for others we give. We give to him and we give to meet the needs of a needy world around us. And look at what Paul writes, an amazing principle, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So here, let's just look at it in financial terms. If I've got a dollar bill in my hand and I'm holding on to it because I need that dollar, I want that dollar, I have to have that dollar. I've got to pay a toll and I need that dollar, right? Well, you can't take it from me. My hand is closed. On the other hand, if it's open, you could take it from me. But if it's open, I can also receive. See, if it's closed, I can't receive. If it's open, I can receive. So if I am open-hearted, if I am generous, if God smiles on me and blesses me and I think, you know, 
this person has a need here, I could be generous towards them, then it opens up a, a path and fountain of generosity where God can now entrust more because he knows our heart is not to build our own kingdom or to better ourselves, but to help others. So generosity begets generosity. It's the same with our time. It's the same with our attitudes towards others as we're generous and gracious and kind towards them. It begets that type of response back to us. And as we are generous with our funds for the gospel and to help others, it begets a return in that way, which creates a cycle of giving and life and blessing. Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, let's get straight back to the phones. Uh, let's go to Carlos in Ohio. Welcome to the Line of Fire. My question, sir, to you is, uh, are we to read the Bible in black and white in the sense of uh, it says what it means what it says and it says what it means? Uh, and, and my, one of the particular things that I'm talking about is uh, right now there's so much confusion in the homosexual uh, lifestyle. Uh, I listen to different people besides you. Uh, some believe that uh, that a homosexual Christian can be a homosexual as long as he or she are not practicing it. Am I am I to to believe that or right? So so uh, yeah, a, 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 a couple of things, Carlos. Just, just a, a little bit of problem in the connection. So you, you can hear me, but we won't hear any any uh, echo in, in the background. Okay, number one we are to read the Bible as it was intended to be read. So history you read as history, poetry as poetry. Uh, when you said, should we read it in black and white? That's an idiom then, right? What does it mean in black and white? So when the Bible uses an idiom, we understand it's an idiom. Uh, when, when, it's, when it's using an allegory, we understand it's an allegory. When it's saying, don't murder, here's a command, don't murder. If you murder, you'll be put to death. That's literally what it means, just like the law. Just like when you're driving down the road and speed limit 45 miles an hour, that doesn't mean four plus five equals nine and nine is like 90, so I can go 90. No, it's 45. So when, when the Bible calls us to repent and believe, that's literally what it means. The Bible explicitly forbids homosexual practice. The Bible explicitly forbids a man lying with a man or a woman with a woman. It explicitly says this is contrary to God's design at creation. It explicitly says those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God, just like those who practice many other things that God forbids in Scripture will not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, what about someone who is same-sex attracted but doesn't act on it, says it is wrong in God's sight? repudiates it, and if God doesn't change them, is content to be single, God bless that person. Thank God for them. If they can continue to grow in grace and see a change in their desires, wonderful. If they say, Lord, the very feeling of this is unclean, purge me, cleanse me, wonderful. But as long as they are not acting on the flesh, then, then you need to honor, support, and encourage should they identify as gay Christian or say, I'm a homosexual, but not practicing? No, 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 no. That's using the terminology and thought of the world. They should say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, do you struggle with anything? Yeah, I've struggled with same-sex attraction, but I say no to it, and I turn to the Lord for grace. Just like someone else may struggle with opposite-sex attraction. You know, a single guy and heavily attracted to the opposite sex, but no sexual outlet. You say no to it and you honor the Lord. In the one case, homosexual, there is no possibility of a relationship with someone of the same sex in a sexual romantic way that God will bless. That's clear. When it comes to heterosexual, then there could be the potential of, of marriage to the opposite sex in a holy way that God will bless. So we're not comparing apples with apples there, but do not identify it as homosexual, gay. Rather, I'm a follower of Jesus, yeah, and I, I struggle with same-sex attraction. My friend uh, struggles with, uh, uh, with this. My other friend struggles with this. But we say no to it. Jesus called us to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. And by his grace, we continue to pursue change. 
Those people need our support, our encouragement, our love, our friendship. If they fall 10 times, we help them back up and move forward in Jesus' name. Thank you for the question. All right, let us go to Roy in Montana. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hey, I have a quick question here, real quick. Um, there, You did a teaching years ago when you were in Baltimore, and you did it on, like, Finney and Crane Hyde, Anani and Judson. And I love those, and I have it downloaded to my really old iPod, but I'd like to give them at gifts. Is there anywhere I can get those? Yeah, if you go to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, and click on store, you'll see it in the audio resources, Giants of the Faith. Yes, yeah, Smith Wigglesworth, Adoniram Judson, George yeah. Whitfield, John Lake, Praying Hyde. Boy, those were staggering people to teach on. I remember when I, when I would teach on those, when I lived actually, in, we did those in, in Rockville, Maryland. And when I would teach on those late 80s, early 90s, I'd get home after teaching, say teaching on the, the prayer life of John Hyde. Uh, and, and I'd be completely devastated. I thought, I, I had never touched this in a million years. And then I'd wake up the next morning and say, if God used them, he could use me. The challenge was every week was such a stretch. You know, Wigglesworth on faith, <laughs> Judson on sacrificial service, you know, and so it was, it was a jarring thing each week, but many were blessed by those. So we, we, the, the audio series on those that we distribute, it's still, it's still that, that audio series. I taught it late eighties, early nineties. We thought, good, it's the best I've taught it. So that's where you can get it. Ask Dr. Brown dot org oh. store, and it should be under audio resources. Thank you. Cause they are awesome. Well, thank well, you. I, yeah. My, my, go ahead. Yeah. My question to you is, you know, God's people should give. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that God's people should give, but is there any place in the old Testament that tells you to tithe money? Like where it seems to me like it should be, you know, back then it was like a 10th of your crops or your wine. And it was so many times a year or whatever. And you know, actually, know, actually though, I like mean, if, God, if you'll read, if you'll study the laws in Deuteronomy, when the people were to bring tithes to Jerusalem uh, every several years, they were converted into money. So take whatever of, of the crops, of, of the flocks, et cetera, convert it into money and then bring the money. And then that would be given. So that's just, the it, again, all we're doing is being practical, updating things as of today. And uh, look, I've been in services in India where the people come and they, they put a pineapple in the front or they put this vegetable in the front and that's their offering. That's what they have. Uh, and it's very sacred when I see that. But practically, we, we deal with money today, but it's the same principle. But in Deuteronomy, you'll see that. Hey, thank you for the call. And let's go uh, to Drew in Maryland. Uh, we've only got a few minutes, but let's do the best we can to dive in. Go ahead, please. All right. Hello, Dr. Brown. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? All right. The question I have is, how do I get over some anger and resentment towards towards my towards my parents, especially when I feel like they should have known better, especially as Christian parents? Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. I'm I'm not going to ask more questions, just so I can answer in more detail. These are very challenging things especially when we feel, hey, I have a lifelong wound because of this. I'm carrying the weight of this. I'm still scarred by this. Why didn't they see? Why didn't they do better? So the first thing is we spend time in God's presence, praying for God's best for them and thanking God for them, for every good thing they did, for every sacrifice they made, for efforts that they made. That's the first thing. Second we remember how God forgave us. How many times have we blown it? Since we've been believers, how many times have we blown it? How many times have we disobeyed or fallen short or let others down? How does God forgive us? Does he say, well, I'm not going to forgive because you knew better. No, I'm going to hold this against you because at this stage of life, you shouldn't be doing it anymore. No, he forgives through the cross. Jesus tells us, Paul says, as you've been forgiven, forgive. 
So you meditate on that. God, how do you forgive me? That song called to forgive others. And read through Matthew 18, the parable at the end of that chapter. Read, read that through. So you pray for them. You thank God for them. You meditate on how God gave you. You look at how strongly Jesus says we have to forgive from the heart the same way that we've been forgiven. And then you make a quality decision. Lord, even though I may not feel it, I am going to volitionally forgive in your sight. I'm not going to hold this against them. From the heart, I'm going to forgive as much as it lies in me. And where I fall short, I'm asking you to take it from here. If you'll do those things, God will give you grace. I, I think of Corey Ten Boom talking about giving a Christian presentation and meeting a former Nazi at the end of it who was just so glad to meet her. And she realized this is the man that basically tortured my sister in, in, in prison, watched her die. And, and when God said, forgive him, forgive him, she, she couldn't. She just could I mean, how could you? Come on. But she knew what God wanted, and she reached out her hand, and as she did, the Spirit of God just came through her and, and, and touched her and touched him to the point of weeping. So you do those things. You, you pray for them regularly. If they're not alive, you thank God for them every way that you can. Recognize how God forgives us, the depth of it, that we do not deserve it, zero of it, and he gives us all of it. And then in God's sight, on your knees, say, Lord, I choose to forgive with everything in me. Help me to do it. If you don't feel it, speak it anyway, and the grace will follow and enable you. Don't carry it, my brother. Don't hold on to unforgiveness. It's unhealthy. It's unbiblical. Releasing them will release you. Have an awesome weekend, friends. Remember the website, askdrbrown.org. Make sure you're getting our emails.